The following message is a presentation of Ligonier Ministries, home of the radio program Renewing Your Mind with R.C. Sproul. We're continuing now with our exposition of the very important document that has been produced by evangelical leaders in an effort to restore unity among evangelicals on the meaning of the gospel and we are looking at the Articles of Affirmation and Denial. And today, we come to Article Number 4. And the affirmation reads as follows. We affirm that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation, the only mediator between God and humanity. We deny that anyone is saved in any other way than by Jesus Christ and His gospel. The Bible offers no hope that sincere worshipers of other religions will be saved without personal faith in Jesus Christ. I can't imagine an affirmation that would meet with more resistance from the American public than this one because it is so narrow and so downright un-American. If anything strikes an axe at the root of the tree of pluralism, and relativism, it is any claim of exclusivity to any one religion. We have been inundated with the viewpoint that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere and that there are many roads that lead to heaven and God is not so narrow that he requires a strict allegiance to one way or to one mediator. But of course, at this point, the framers of this document are not trying to declare their own bigotry or narrow-mindedness, but they are trying to be faithful to the unambiguous teaching of sacred scripture, of the New Testament authors, and not the least to the teaching of Jesus himself, who declared to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Now, another New Testament reference that's vital to understand this affirmation, namely that Christ is the only mediator between God and humanity, is found in Paul's first letter to Timothy in the second chapter and the fifth verse, where we read these words, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom to be testified in due time. Here, is affirmed by the Apostle the uniqueness of Christ. And the terms of that uniqueness that are specifically mentioned here in the text focus on the role of Christ as mediator. Now there's a little bit of ambiguity here in this text in terms of what the Apostle declares when he says there is one mediator between God and mankind, even the man, Jesus Christ. What's strange about this declaration by the Apostle is that throughout biblical history, particularly in the Old Testament, there are several people who function as mediators. A mediator is a go-between, someone who stands in the middle between two parties, usually between two parties that are estranged or involved in some kind of dispute. The Old Testament sees Moses, for example, as the mediator of the Old Covenant. He represented the people of Israel in his discussions with God, and he was God's spokesman to the people as well. The prophets in the Old Testament had a mediatorial function where they were the spokesmen for God to the people. They stood between the people and God, and so God would reveal himself to the prophets. Then the prophets 
as intermediaries would then say to the people, thus saith the Lord. Also the priests of Israel in the Aaronic priesthood of the Old Testament functioned as mediators in that they spoke to God in behalf of the people. They were intercessors in the people's behalf. Even the king of Israel was seen as a kind of mediator because he was not ruling by his own inherent power, but the view of this was that he was God's representative to the people, and that's why he was held accountable by God to rule in righteousness according to the king's law of the Old Testament. So why then does the Apostle Paul say there is only one mediator between God and man, even the man Jesus Christ? Well, he doesn't tell us why he says that, so I have to guess here for a moment and speculate. One thing we could say at this point is that it depends on the meaning of the word is, <laughs> and, and that he is speaking in the present tense, and maybe all the apostle has in view here is that at the time that he was writing, there was only one existing mediator then, namely Jesus, because these other people were precursors in ancient times. But I doubt very much that that's what Paul had in view. I think that we have to understand the uniqueness of Christ's mediatorial office in terms of the role of mediation that he performed that was indeed utterly unique. And that uniqueness was found not only in his work of mediation, but in his work of mediation because of his person. That Christ and Christ alone was the God-man. He was God incarnate, God with us. And so what does God do to bring about reconciliation and redemption between the estranged parties of God and humanity is that God takes upon himself the form of a human being. And in the man Christ, Christ stands in the gap to bring about the reconciliation between people and his Father. And in that work of mediation, particularly with the work of the atonement, Christ and Christ alone has the qualifications to do what is ultimately needed to bring about reconciliation. We remember St. Anselm, early on in church history, who wrote the little book, in Latin, entitled Cur Deus Homo, which being translated is a question, and the title means, Why the God-Man? And what Anselm did was to spell out in detail why it was necessary for our salvation that our mediator be one who possessed both deity and humanity. Now, so that Christ is unique. Now, what is it that makes the Christian faith unique and differ from all other religions in the world? Well, the answer is simple. It's Christ. No one else has a divine human mediator. No other religion in this world has an atonement that can bridge the gap between God and man. No other world leader or world religious leader ever came back from the dead. Confucius had wisdom, but he died, and he stayed dead. Mohammed is dead. Buddha is dead. And so on down the line. But only Christ had the ability to reconcile God and man. And one of the other credentials that he had that no one else had was his sinlessness, which is referred to later on in this document. But again, the reason that the affirmation that Christ is the only way of salvation is because he alone, in his person, has the credentials necessary to do the work of mediation that must be done to bring about reconciliation. 
Again, I've had people say to me, why is it that God is so narrow that he only provides one Savior? The question is, why would God give any Savior to us? Why would he not just condemn us all and exercise his justice by giving us our just deserts? Why does God go to the trouble in the depths and riches of his grace to give to us a mediator who will stand in our place, who will receive the judgment that we deserve, and who will give to us the righteousness we desperately need? Why he doesn't have two or three of these, I don't know. But the astonishing thing to me is that he bothered to do it once. And I think that people need to be careful, particularly Christians, who are kind of cavalier in sloughing off the uniqueness of Christ and saying, well, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe. You can believe in this religion or that religion and so on. God is jealous for his son. Jesus is his only begotten Son. Three times in the New Testament, God is heard to speak audibly. And in every one of those occasions, it is an audible announcement from heaven about the identity of his Son. This is my Son. Hear him. And if people supplant the position that God has appointed Christ to have from all eternity where he alone is worthy to receive glory and honor, dominion and power. And God declares all men everywhere to embrace Christ and to honor Christ. God is not going to accept a substitute where you can say, well, it doesn't matter. I can go and follow Buddha, who basically was an atheist anyway. But in any case... The whole issue here, biblically, with the one true God. Notice that when Paul makes the statement that there is only one mediator, he prefaces it by saying there's only one God. And the same uniqueness was declared throughout the Old Testament where God took a very dim view of idolatry and the very first commandment was a commandment of exclusivity. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And the worship of Baal, the worship of Dagon, the worship of other pagan deities received not the commendation of God, but the condemnation of God. He wasn't pleased with false religion, but saw in this a systematic rebellion against his own glory. And so Paul brings these together. There's only one God, and God only has one Son. And there's only one mediator between God and mankind. Now, that's very difficult for, as I say, people who have been immersed in pluralism to accept. But they're going to have to quarrel with Christ and with his apostles on this point. The Bible offers no hope that sincere worshipers of other religions will be saved without personal faith in Jesus Christ. Now, there are those who believe that people can be saved who are practitioners of other world religions by Christ, arguing that they are, in effect, worshiping him in ignorance by giving their worship to something or to someone and anybody who is sincerely worshipful or sincerely religious, God will apply the benefits of the work of Christ to them. What this denial is saying is, no, it's not only that Christ is necessary, but personal faith in Christ is necessary as an obligation that God commands to the world, as Paul did when he spoke to the Greeks at Mars Hill, when he said, the former days of ignorance God has overlooked, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent And he goes on to say, because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world by that one whom he has demonstrated and proven to be his Messiah by the raising of the dead. So there is the universal requirement of people to profess faith in Christ. Let's look then at Article 5. We affirm that the church is commanded by God and is therefore under divine obligation 
to preach the gospel to every living person. We deny that any particular class or group of persons, whatever their ethnic or cultural identity, may be ignored or passed over in the preaching of the gospel. God purposes a global church made up of people from every tribe, language, and nation. In the positive side of article number five, there is the affirmation of the mission of the church. That the church's mission is defined in the final analysis not by the church or by the leading ruling committees of the church. The mission of the church is defined by the Lord of the church. And he defines our mission and commands that the church be engaged in evangelism. Evangelism is never an option for the church. Mission is never an option for the church if the church is to be obedient to the Lord and to the head of the church. Because the church is commanded to preach the gospel to every living person. One of the great scandals of historic Christianity is the reluctance with which the church has responded to this command. There remain still many, many millions of people in this world who have never heard of Jesus Christ. In fact, on this day in history, as I'm speaking to you, a record is being set that today more people will die on planet Earth without ever hearing of Jesus Christ than will have died on any other day in human history. And the record that we are setting today is breaking the record that was set yesterday. And the record that we are setting today will be broken tomorrow. Because we're at that point in population growth and explosion where the population of the world is expanding at a faster rate than the missionary enterprise of the church is addressing. And we have simply not fulfilled the Great Commission. We have not done what we are obligated as the church to do because we are commanded to see to it that the gospel is preached to every living person. Now, in the denial, the denial I find interesting, we deny that any particular class or group of persons, whatever their ethnic or cultural identity, may be ignored or passed over in the preaching of the gospel. What does that mean? We know the expression, birds of a feather flock together. Social historians, sociologists, anthropologists have noticed that there is a particular socioeconomic identity of virtually every Protestant denomination in America. That our denomination do not necessarily follow theological lines as much as they follow socioeconomic lines of demarcation or ethnic lines, ethnic background lines. The Dutch go one way, the Germans go another way, and so on. The Scots, Irish, they're all Presbyterians and so on. We tend to go that way. And we tend to focus our outreach on people like ourselves. We don't want to include minority groups. And what this denial is saying is that we are not to be exclusive in this. We are to preach the gospel to people from every conceivable background, from every ethnic group, but not only that, from every religious group. You know, sometimes we can engage in cross-cultural evangelism, but we will not evangelize Muslims, or we will not evangelize people who are involved in other world religions because we somehow think that they are to be excluded from the outreach ministry of the church. No. The command of God to the people of God is to preach the gospel to every tongue, to every nation, to every tribe, to every living person without distinction. 
that is an awesome obligation and one that we have been, I'm afraid, very derelict in fulfilling. Perhaps today you've been somewhat concerned or disturbed or suffered consternation to hear me talk in such narrow terms of the exclusivity of Christ and of the Christian faith. And if that has been the case for you, let me ask you simply to think about this. Think through the ramifications of what it would mean to put leaders of other religions on the same scale or the same level as Christ. In one sense, there is no greater insult than to mention Christ in the same breath with Mohammed, for example. That if indeed Christ is who he claims to be, there is no one else who comes close if he is who he is. In fact, if it's true that there are many ways to God, then I would guess that one of them is not Christ. Because I can't imagine one way to God declaring to the world that he's the only way to God. The other thing I want you to think about soberly is this. If you were to die tonight and stand before God and say to God, why were you so narrow? Why did you only give us one Savior? What do you think God would say to you? In fact, I can't imagine any person ever standing before God suggesting to God that he has not done enough considering what he has done for us in Christ Jesus. For more information about Ligonier Ministries, call 1-800-435-4343 or contact us on the web at Ligonier.org. That's L-I-G-O-N-I-E-R dot O-R-G. Or write P.O. Box 54 Orlando, Florida 32854.